welcome everyone, and uh, you know what a pleasure, uh, Elbridge, to have you here. We have uh, Elbridge Colby uh, here from the Marathon Initiative. Uh, he's uh, been grateful enough to spend some time with us here in Ottawa. Um, we just had a robust discussion um, uh, here at the Rideau Club. But uh, Elbridge, I'd love to kind of focus a little bit in this discussion on your book. Um, and I mean, you had the fundamental challenge of, of having this book come out during the pandemic. So that's an, <laughs> another uh, interesting nugget that I'd love to, to get into, uh, you know, as you've, you've had discussions. But the book uh, is uh, the, the strategy of denial, um, America, American defense in the age of great power conflict. And uh, Bridge, as we've been talking uh, over the past few hours, obviously with the, the current tensions in the Taiwan Strait, and uh, while these may not be new, I think this is another reminder of the importance of, of the argument that you put forth in your book. So I wonder if we just start off um, with thinking about, you know, the process of writing this book. You know, uh, what made you, what were the main drivers um, in the American defense and security debate that made you think that, that now is the time to have a book um, uh, come out on this topic, and also what's been the reception so far? I mean, I think you've heard some of the reception here in Canada um, in your, your trip so far, but internationally, what's been the reception of your book? Uh, how have you been trying to articulate this argument um, to America's key allies? Great, well, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Thanks to MLI for, for hosting me. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and it's really uh, also a pleasure and, and a privilege to be able to engage with our Canadian friends and allies and neighbors, uh, so uh, really a, a delight. Um, the book was motivated, I would say, sub substantively by my sense, my perception that America's kind of legacy foreign policy, and particularly our defense strategy, was getting outstripped by the geopolitical realities. And basically that, you know, America is no longer the unipolar hegemon of, say, the 1990s or early 2000s, but that the world, you know, power was much more diffused. And we were kind of going on autopilot in the United States. Um, uh, in terms of thinking about how we would use our, our military and our, our, our power more, more generally, and that that's a recipe for disaster. There was a basic disjuncture, like in a company or even a family budget, between what we were saying we were going to do and what we actually were prepared to do. So um, actually, in some sense, it's a little, a little odd, because when I was in the Pentagon in 2017, 2018, I worked on the national defense strategy. And that strategy actually sort of initiated the shift towards this, you know, recognize that we were in that not in that unipolar moment anymore, that we were not focus on counterinsurgency or counterterrorism is our number one problem, and that we would focus on China. So in some sense, maybe I put the cart before the horse. I, I sort of worked in the government, you know, was able to put into, help put into effect some of these ideas before I wrote the book. So, but that gets to the personal sense, which is, um, why did I write the book? Well, I, a lot of it was motivated by my experience in the Pentagon, and it's not about my, my bureaucratic travails or anything. And it was building on, you know, kind of 20 years of my, my thinking. But what I felt was that we, I, somebody needed to put out in a kind of comprehensive, logical and accessible way, and whether I succeeded or not is for others to judge, but to try to put that out so that not only people in the American defense establishment, but Amer people in the American political system, journalists, and regular, you know, Americans could make a decision about what, what you know, what should our defense strategy be and be well informed and see the, I think the argument, my argument for, for why we should focus in particular on China in the way that, that I argue. And I wanted to write it in a way that was accessible to everybody. It's not necessarily an easy book, but it, it, it's not technical. And by the same token, I wanted to write it very much for our allies and our partners. And in fact, even to some sense for China and Russia, I mean, the last chapter is in some sense a message to China. Um, but I think it's critical both for our, our point of view that we need our allies to understand and internalize what we're saying so they can react appropriately, but also an argument for why you know, allies should care, and I think that's as true uh, in Canada as anywhere else. And I mean, I, I have to say I've been pleased by the re reaction in the sense that people, I think, have taken it in the spirit in which it was written. It's not, it's not saying that I have the last word on every point, but it's more of like a logical structure and argument for why I think we should, you know, why we need to prioritize, why we should prioritize on China, why we should prioritize building a, what I call a denial defense and what that means. And so, you know, it's, it's designed more to stimulate and kind of, I would say, sort of channel debate than to be the last word, because, of course, I, I wouldn't presume to do that. I mean, that's really fascinating. I mean, I think, you know, your primary audience, obviously, this is an American national security defense strategy book. But I think I liked your point there that um, the audience is not just the United States. It's, it's clearly also focused on the allies. And on that point, I want to hinge to Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, and the burden sharing um, arguments have been there for decades. I mean, this is not a new um, debate, whether it's in the Asia Pacific or whether it's in the transatlantic. But does this moment, in a, in a way, I think it almost sort of 
uh, validates some of the arguments that you've had in your book, that we need very serious discussions about allied burden sharing, um, whether it's in the Pacific, whether it's in the transatlantic. So I wonder if you can dig into this mm -hmm. a little bit more, especially as this relates to Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, what do we expect of our European partners? Uh, what level of commitment do we need on defense spending? Uh, and how that pertains to the Pacific as well. Sure. Well, actually, I would say it's the war in Ukraine and the recent crisis over Taiwan together that show you the, the, the nature of the problem. And by the way, you know, the negotiations over the, the Iran nuclear deal and the tensions around there. That shows you that the United States has a kind of a multi-front problem. And look, the, the factual reality is that the United States is effectively the kind of leader of this alliance network. Uh, around the world. And, you know, it's gone through various permutations in the post-World War II era. But basically, what the United States decides to do is going to be of intense interest to many countries, especially the ones that are most threatened. But because of the nature of this, of this structure, for good or ill, I mean, I think largely for good, but, but that it, it is the world as it exists. So, so what we in the United States are thinking, and we should be aware, uh, and, and we are, of, of the permutations and the implications for, for, other, for other countries, especially our allies, um, I think what, what the Ukraine and the Taiwan crisis show is that we face multi-front problem. Mm. And the, 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 the empirical reality is that we are no longer indisputably the dominant power in the world. China has an economy that's as large as ours. Russia obviously is a very serious threat and uh, you know, dangerous. At the same time, there's Iran, North Korea, terrorism. You could go on, Cuba, Venezuela, et cetera. You, know, you could multiply on and on if you, if you want. So there's a, there's a lot of problems out there. And the simple fact is we can't do it all by ourselves. I mean, first of all, like you, we're here in North America. We're far from a lot of these critical theaters in, in Eurasia. Uh, and we just don't have the, the power anymore. And that's not to like self-flagellate as an American. I mean, we're not perfect, but I, you know, I'm proud to be an American. But it's just, a, 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 again, a factual reality. And so I think you know, there are a number of things that we need to do. I think the, the United States needs to focus a lot more on Asia, which is the critical decisive theater because of China. And, the, and that's where the largest share of the global economy will be. But also, um, uh, you know, I think our allies do need to do more, and they need to focus more on on the real on developing real military capabilities. And you know, it's interesting during the Cold War, this was actually much more on people's minds, and the, and the the, the burden sharing uh, was actually more equitable. But I, I want to stress this isn't just a problem of fairness. Fairness is a big issue because it, it it relates to whether the American people will support this posture over the long term. But even more than fairness there's just not enough American power to do all of these things uh, on our own. So we need our allies to do their part. During the Cold War, actually, it was, it was a better situation. Europe, I think, was about 50% of NATO expenditures. Now it's more like, I think, 25%. That just can't go on anymore. You know, and there's been good signs. Countries like Poland have really increased. Um, a number of Romanians, I believe the, uh, the Finns and the Swedes, now that they're coming into NATO. Uh, the Germans have made the... Um, the, the pledge, but it's very questionable now whether they're going to fall through. That's unacceptable. We need them to do more. We also need uh, particularly Japan to do a lot more. Uh, and, and of course, Taiwan itself, which is acutely threatened. And in this vein, I would say I, I, it really makes sense for me that Canada would do a lot more. I mean, I, Canada is a NATO member. It was in both world wars for longer than the United States was. It was in uh, NATO during the Cold War on the inter-German border. It's committed to, to spend 2% of GDP on defense. I think all of us would welcome a more robust Canadian defense commitment that's consistent with Canada's proud national traditions. Well, thanks very much, Bridget. And on that point, I fully agree with you. And I mean, this is something that, that I've mentioned several times that the Canadian side, often we like to see ourselves as European, but the reality is that we do have a very long Pacific coastline. We have a diaspora that is a, a very strong Asian diaspora. We have trade and security links uh, to that part of, of the region. Even, for example, um, on the Korean Peninsula, being an original mm -hmm. member of, of UNC Command, uh, taking part right now in the Five Eyes Plus uh, counter sanctions, evasion, um, emission operation neon that we call it uh, on the Korean Peninsula. We do have stakes here, but I find it's been a it's been a challenge for us to really articulate those mm -hmm. stakes. I wanted to get back to a couple points. First, that I think you addressed in your book, and I think you've also addressed it in a recent article that you did for Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. on why the U.S. needs to get much more serious about uh, the threat of, of uh, conflict in Taiwan. And this is that gap between the rhetoric that you hear and the action. Um, you know, symbolism is one thing, you know, political um, statements on certain things, whether it's in a G7 context, whether it's bilaterally, whether it's through the Quad uh, or other organizations, but then there's actual real action. And whether this is in the American context, frankly, I think we're seeing this also play out in Canada and in Europe and other capitals where 
there's consensus might not be the right word, but there's a general coalescing and an understanding that China is a real challenge and potentially a threat. Um, but what does that actually mean in terms of action? And I think we're at this moment. So I wonder if you could kind of dig into this a little bit more, obviously initially from the U.S. perspective, but more globally, this, this gap between rhetoric on one hand and actual real action. Yeah. Well, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I would say there's been a lot of progress in the United States and around the world and among our key allies, uh, not only in Asia, but in, in uh, Europe and I think in Canada as well, that understanding that China is a, a profound challenge and, and a threat uh, in many ways. Um, but so that's good. It's it measured against where we used to be, but measured against what's required, we're failing. We're failing in the United States and we're failing, I would say, in the, in the allied networks. And part of that is because of just the simple scale of China. I mean, again, it's an economy that's as large as our own uh, in the United States. 1.4 billion people who've now basically figured out how to climb the ladder of economic development and are likely to continue to do so. Certainly that the money flowing into China suggests that people think the Chinese is going to continue to grow. How much, we don't know. Uh, but I, I would surmise that it will probably continue to grow at least at a significant rate, um, a moderate rate. Um, and uh, so it's, it's very large. And also that the, the risk of military conflict is very real, and it's very real in this decade. Um, I mean, we don't have to sort of speculate because the Chinese are building a military. I mean, as Admiral Aquilino of Indo-Pacific Command points out, it's a historic military buildup, depending on how you measure it. It's the largest peacetime military buildup since the second, before the Second World War. Um, they are initiating an enormous nuclear weapons buildup. Uh, and they are now, of course, in the last couple of weeks, they've exercised these military capabilities around the island of Taiwan to give a sense of what kind of capabilities they have. Um, in the past, there was a sense that the Chinese would not upset the apple cart, uh, you know, in terms of economic growth. But uh, they haven't just been building this military. They've also been saying, you know, that they uh, are prepared to use it. And the, the thing is that the, the good news that's happening, that people are waking up to China being a problem, is also a risk because it, 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 it then can give China the, inc the incentive to move, uh, you know, effectively before that coalition coalesces. So, you know, the, the problem is that a little bit that we're banging our drums and, you know, beating our chests, uh, but we're not necessarily, uh, you know, hitting the weight room and strengthening ourselves. The example I used uh, uh, in a Japanese uh, interview the other day was, I don't know if you remember Rocky IV, but where Apollo Creed, you know, is like, it's banging his chest. And meanwhile, this sort of Soviet guy, you know, Dolph Lundgren is really ready and, and all business. And that's a little bit where we are. And then, and then Apollo Creed gets killed in the ring. And that's a little bit what we risk here. And, you know, to your point about my article in Foreign Affairs this week is all about the fact that the Biden administration has commendably been saying China's our top threat and they're a near peer rival and we need to focus on Taiwan. But the actual military investments and focus have not been there. And so I don't want to say that, that, that the U.S. Is, is doing perfectly and, and everybody else needs to get, get, get religion. No, we all need to get, get focused. And, and, and that's, uh, uh, you know, as true of us as, any, as anyone else. But I fear that uh, we have little time because the most reliable way we will we'll get peace, you know, it's the old adage, but it's an adage because it's, I think it's a prudent counsel is if you want peace, prepare for war. Mm -hmm. And that's the lesson that we learned, I think, after world, during World War II. And then we took to heart in the Cold War, which for all its, you know, uh, tragedies did not involve a major war in the central theater and ended up with us, you know, having a, a, a success. And we'll be lucky if we get that. I mean, a lot of people talk about a long-term competition with China. We'll be lucky if we get a long-term competition with China, because if they make moves in Asia, which is the world's central economic theater, and are able to establish a hegemonic position, we won't be in that position. We'll live in a Chinese-dominated world. And I think if you watch what's happening in Australia, for instance, or what they're saying to Taiwan, or even the Chinese ambassador in France, who I guess had been the ambassador here in Canada before, openly talking about sending people to re-education camps. Well, I don't want to live in that world. I don't think a lot of other people do too. So let's get ready for it so that we persuade Beijing that they're better off not risking it because it's not gonna work for them. Well, thanks very much, Bridget. I mean, uh, a big fan of Rocky IV, and I think for some of our younger viewers, well, maybe we'll have to send- <laughs> I know, it's a little a, dating ourselves but, here, but, John. But, but, <laughs> I, but, I, but I like that analogy. Um, so one last very unfair question okay. uh, to you, Bridge, um, and sort of harking back to your yeah. article that you just wrote in Foreign Affairs. Um, if you were to put, as you said, time yeah. is not on our side. Yeah. If you were to look 10 years into the future, what is the real probability of an inadvertent uh, or advertent mm. uh, uh, clash or conflict between the United States and China? And I guess an add-on question to this is, of course, Taiwan is where most of our focus is. But at least from my own vantage point, it'll be in the Chinese interest to broaden this mm -hmm. out. 
And I think one of the examples that we recently saw from these rehearsal exercises was very intentionally um, placing ballistic missiles in Japan's EEZ. They will have uh, great motivations and drivers to, to press on multiple points, whether that's in the South China Sea, whether that's in the East China Sea, over the Senkaku with Japan, or frankly, even in the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how much the U.S. defense establishment um, is, is thinking about this, thinking about not these issues in siloed, so not just saying, well, we have to deal with the Taiwan, Taiwan contingency, but the idea that we might have to deal with it all at once. Yep. Um, so love your, your, sure. your views on that. Well, look, I'm, I'm smart enough not to put a, a precise probability <laughs> figure. I just try to lay out the, the, the factors as I see them. But I'll tell you this, that I'm not alone in seeing this decade as being very real. I think it's becoming a very real possibility of a conflict between the United States and China. In fact, I think it's approaching becoming the conventional wisdom in the U.S. security discussion. So Admiral Phil Davidson, the commander of Indo-PACOM, last year in early 2021 indicated that the Chinese wanted to have the ability to resolve the Taiwan question militarily by 2027. At the time, that was greeted with some skepticism. That now appears to be the official administration position. Both DNI Avril Haines and uh, the CIA director Bill Burns have kind of signaled that th they've come closer to that position. Now, nobody knows, right, because there's a t tremendous number of uncertainties. But, you know, look, the, the military balance may shift in China's favor in this decade if we're not prepared. Uh, and they may think that that, that advantage could be fleeting, which would give them a rational incentive. Uh, Xi Jinping's own personal clock. Uh, why, did she, why did Vladimir Putin invade Ukraine? Well, probably partially because he saw it as a legacy project. Xi Jinping has signaled that. So those are a couple of reasons. I'm actually not so concerned about an accidental conflict. I'm, a, I'm concerned about a deliberate conflict because I don't think major wars tend to happen accidentally. They tend to happen because countries are prepared. There might be a sort of a, there might be escalation that isn't strictly desirable, but countries know what they're doing when they get into it. And that, I think, is a very real possibility. The way to drive the risk higher is to continue to underprepare, because then it will make it more advantageous to China. And then I think it'll be more rational for them. And then I think it'll be more likely. So I think this is what we should really be focused on. And you know, if we get that right, everything else is manageable. And if we don't, everything else will be in a much more troubling position. In terms of the other fronts for China, I do think they're going to want to press us on various fronts. I think China's best strategy is not to take on everybody at the same time, but to put pressure and distract us. This is my main concern about Ukraine. Um, I mean, I wrote in a piece in the Wall Street Journal with my, my friend Oriana Mastro uh, saying, you know, warning, I think that, that we cannot allow Ukraine to become a distraction from Taiwan. We, can, we should support Ukraine, but only consistent with our ability to prioritize Taiwan. And I fear that that is actually what's happened. Mm -hmm. And I think the nature of the Sino-Russian uh, relationship at this point is such that the Chinese may have a leverage over Russia to induce them to create a secondary dis you know, kind of problem for the United States. And Iran might go along because the incentive is if you're one of these powers that are becoming more aligned, I mean, look at the Russian-Iranian uh, collaboration over drones mm -hmm. recently. The incentive is to operate when the Americans are distracted. So when it, when it rains, it pours. That's the problem. And China's going to have a lot of leverage, and it's going to be able to offer a lot to these other countries that's going to create multiple problems. And that's, again, where, where we need our allies to step up, because we don't have a military, and we won't have a military that can handle all these things at the same time. Yeah. Well, Bridge, I think we've imposed on your time uh, you. enough already. But that, yeah, I pleasure. Mean, the, 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 you know, the somber part, as, much, as serious and sobering as these discussions are, they're necessary to have. Yeah. Um, we don't have all the answers right now. Uh, we will have to have you back uh, for a, a second pleasure. time. Thank you. But again, really appreciate you coming to Ottawa and, and joining us and for all of our audience members tuning in. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have you back again soon. It would be an honor. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah.